Okay, I think we have given people enough time to hop in, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Amber Spratlin. I am a uh, research and instruction librarian. I have a very, very long title. I'm a research and instruction librarian in uh, Maryville Library, and I specifically work with online programs. As we were talking about in the chat before we got started, I am actually based in the Atlanta, Georgia area, so I am not on campus, and I understand that you guys are not on campus either. And so just because you're a distance student does not mean that you don't have access to everything that the library has to offer. You do. And if you didn't, I wouldn't exist. So, so please uh, feel confident in the fact that if there are resources that you need for your research, we can make those available to you. So our objectives tonight are that by the end of this meeting, you will be able to identify appropriate resources for your evidence-based practice research, and you will be able to form a PICO-based search in discovery, AKA what you were calling EBSCO earlier. So let's start off with a larger question. What resources should you use for your research? And to kick us off, we're going to have just a general activity where we're going to talk about where we find our information in our daily lives. So if you would please pull out a device that can be your phone, uh, it could be your laptop, whatever you have. And I want you to go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code 57359210. That information is also on your screen. When you do that, we are going to have a little chat anonymously in Minty. If you'll give me a thumbs up when you do get into the Minty, uh, that'll let me know that everybody is in there and we can move on. I am going to go ahead and go to the next slide so that we can start the discussion, but this information will also be on that slide. So the question I wanna ask you first, this evening is about how you find your information. So in your daily life, where do you get your news? Where do you get your information? Could be Facebook. Honest answers only. If you get all of your news from TikTok, that's okay. I just, <laughs> we're just gonna have an honest conversation about that. Google searches, social media, Hippocrates, and Instagram. Yep. Television, printed and written media. Anywhere else? This is pretty typical. This is also how I get a lot of my news. These are where we see our headlines first because it's native to us. We pick up our phones in the morning when we wake up and we see things. Radio, that's one that I wasn't expecting, but also good. You're driving to work during the day and listening to the radio and you hear news, maybe NPR, maybe just a regular radio station. Now my question for you is, and we can talk in the chat or you can come off mic, do you think that these sources of information that we use in our day-to-day -day lives is this the kind of information that you want to use in your papers at Maryville or in the nursing program? No, I got a no in the chat. <laughs> what do the rest of you think? <laughs> no. Well, why not? It's what we use every day. Isn't it legitimate? Not scholarly, says Andrea. Well, then I ask you this, what does it mean to be scholarly? What is a scholarly resource and why is it different from what you would see on Instagram or TikTok or on TV? Subject to bias and unfounded, also a very good explanation. Scholarly means peers have authenticated the info also in the chat. That is what someone said. Um, yes, and then Andrea says it would be backed by evidence. Also, yes. But I really want to hone in on that scholarly and peers uh, language that someone was using in the chat. 
the gold standard for research that you want to use in your papers and especially in your academic work, the gold standard is peer review. There is a process that specific articles go through called peer review. To be published in an academic or a scholarly journal, it has to go through this process. Now, peer review means that an expert in the field writes an article about a very specific subject. Maybe they did some research, maybe they read other people's research and they're commentating or creating critical analysis of that. And then they submit it to an academic journal. And then that journal distributes their article to other experts. This is typically a blind process. So the other experts do not know who has written the article so that there can't be bias. They read the article, they suggest edits. Maybe they say, this doesn't sound right. Or actually, I know about this piece of research that refutes this. And then they submit their edits back to the journal. They give that back to the original author. The original author is heartbroken. <laughs> it's a terrible process for all. Um, the author will rewrite the article with those edits and then resubmit it and then it will be published. Now the difference between that peer review process and what you could see online is that anything could be posted online. There's typically not an editorial process and anything could be published. Even on some news websites that seem legitimate. So you really want to check into when you're on the open web editorial processes, but when you are writing academic literature, your sources need to be peer reviewed. Again, that's the gold standard. If you're just joining us, we're talking about peer review and scholarly resources. If everybody wouldn't mind, please mute your microphones. That helps with feedback in the video recording. So we know that we need scholarly resources, but there are also these things called primary sources and secondary sources. And a lot of people who are in Nursing 601 have a hard time determining the difference between those two things. And you definitely need to have a solid foundation of knowledge in this so that you choose the right kinds of sources for your paper. So what are the differences? A primary source is a firsthand account. It is written by the person who did the research. There is original research involved. That means that there may have been an experiment or a survey. You will see that there is data collection in that article. So they'll say, you know, uh, results. <laughs> there might be a results section. And then they'll tell the results of their survey. 60 people said this and 70 people said that or we tried this medication on the experiment group and 32 of them improved with their behaviors. And then in the placebo group, this many people did not improve in their behaviors. So there will be original research and data collection. You might see the phrase we measured and it might be called a randomized controlled trial. These are the things that you're looking for, for your evidence-based practice papers. Secondary sources, on the other hand, are secondary accounts. They're secondhand news. Uh, they are observing the data collection of other people. They might be synthesizing information from many different studies, none of which they did themselves. It might be called a review. They draw conclusions from other data sources that are not their own. And it might be called a meta-analysis or a systematic review. Have you guys already run across articles that are called meta-analysis or systematic review? Those are secondary sources. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not usable. At the bottom of a secondary source, you'll find a references list, and that will give a list of all of the things that they talk about in their article. And there are likely many primary sources listed in that references list. So I would encourage you, if you find a really, really great review article, to look at their references list and then go straight to the source as well, because their sources are probably very valuable to your research. Let's move on. <laughs> 
So again, your resources should be primary and they should be peer reviewed. So we don't want to pull things out of the open web, the place where we normally get our news. We want to make sure that it's coming from a scholarly academic journal. And then we also want to make sure that those are primary. So I have a question in the chat. Let me look at that real quick. Okay, so let's say a theorist did a study and then was interviewed by the news media. The instructor said that the news media report is a primary source. That is true. So remember, a primary source is also a first-hand account. And so if you find an interview with a theorist, for example, who um, is giving a first-hand account of their life, their work, their research, that would be a primary source. Outside of nursing, primary source has a broader definition. So it could be a diary or a letter or a news report if that person appears in it, like an interview. Um, what would be a secondary source in that case would be if there was a news piece about a person and that person does not appear <laughs> and they are not directly quoted. All right, so we're looking for primary and we're looking for peer reviewed. Finding sources, this is what we're all here for. <laughs> so as promised, I wanna talk a little bit about what the library resources are, because I recognize that many of you have probably gone through your entire undergrad education and really never been told or given a vocabulary for these library terms. And it can be really useful <laughs> to understand the vocabulary around what we're talking about, what's a database, what is an EBSCO, for example, um, because someone used that earlier. So hopefully this chart helps solidify that for you a little bit. Think of the library as something built in layers. You are after an article. The article is the smallest unit <laughs> of library resources. So it's in the center of the circle. Articles, like I mentioned, are published in journals. Journals are typically about one specific topic. So that may be as um, direct as, you know, a very specific type of nursing. Maybe it's just about oncology. Or it could be as broad as the whole field of nursing or nursing education or something broad like that. But typically it's one topic in a journal. And so all of the articles that go into that journal are also about that one topic. Within a database, which is the third layer of the library, those house many journals, typically thousands of journals. And those databases are also typically about one broader subject. So we have about 13 nursing databases that contain nursing journals about these different topics. So a database might be about nursing, and then the journal is about oncology, and then the article is about pediatric oncology and bedside manner. So we get more specific as we go down. The outermost layer is what I wanna spend the most time on today because I think it will serve you extremely well. And it's what we call discovery, but what you might know is EBSCO. <laughs> discovery houses almost all of the library's databases in one place. Now you may be thinking that sounds really overwhelming but I'm gonna teach you different strategies on how to refine your results until you get exactly what you need. So I recommend that when you start your research, if you haven't already, that we start on the discovery layer. And then if we need to, we can bump into just the nursing databases. So we'll look at both. Pico. <laughs> you guys should be, um, Pretty familiar with the PICO question at this point, but just in case you are not, a PICO question answers the following or contains the following aspects. A population, an intervention, a comparison to that intervention, and then an outcome. So when you're searching, uh, either in discovery or in the nursing databases, our search string is going to contain most, if not all, of these aspects. Now I want to present to you a metaphor. While I was preparing your workshop, I was also preparing a workshop for Nursing 702, which also deals with evidence-based practice. And I was thinking about PICO a lot. 
And what I realized as I was thinking about Pico, 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 I really love Mexican food. And so all I could think about was Pico de Gallo. So let me offer you this. <laughs> when you go searching, a lot of people get frustrated that they can't find an article that has every single one of the Pico uh, aspects involved in it. And that can be very frustrating. You go out and you create what you think is a beautiful search, and it doesn't seem like the research exists. But to you, I have to say, <laughs> if you can find an article that seems like one ingredient of your Pico, and then you can find another ingredient in another article, and you can synthesize those things together into something new, then you have done a very good job. So don't be frustrated if you get out to do your research and you can only find a tomato or one part of your Pico question. You can put the articles together that you find to draw new conclusions. And that way you're making your own synthesis. You're doing your own synthesis. Is it difficult? Yes. But it's also necessary. And by the end of this course, I have a feeling you'll be very, very good at it. Any questions about what I mean by making Pico? You got to take your tomato. Maybe this article has one piece of information that you need. And this article is your lime juice and it has this piece of information that you need and you put them together and you make something new. So now it's time for not the Pico, but the meat and potatoes of this session. Let's learn how to search in discovery. So I have really, really excellent news for you guys. And that is that we have a tool available to you in our EBSCO discovery service. We just call it discovery that specifically will let you input your Pico aspects, your Pico search terms, and it will create a complex search string on your behalf, which is very exciting. I haven't seen this at any other institution. I feel like you're very lucky and I feel lucky as well. This is the library's website, maryville.edu slash library. If you haven't visited here before, hello, welcome. <laughs> if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a big search bar in the middle of the screen. This is the discovery search bar. Typically you can just enter some search terms into this bar, hit search, and it will bring you articles, eBooks, media, all kinds of different things. But instead of going there directly, I want you to click on advanced search instead because we're advanced users. That will bring up a different kind of menu. You might notice that under these three search bars is a link that says Pico search. This is a gold mine. If you click on that, it will give you search bars specifically for your problem or population your intervention, your comparison, and your outcome. And so your job is now only to um, reduce your PICO question down into very simple terms that you can enter into the search bar. So does anybody have a PICO question that they would like me to use in the PICO search bar to demonstrate how it works? Can nursing rounding reduce falls in an acute care setting. Okay, so as a group, let's work out this PICO search together. Who is the population? Acute care patients. The intervention would be rounding. The outcome has to do with falls. You don't necessarily have a comparison, but that is okay. So I'm going to submit the search and let's see what happens. First thing, you can see that it has created a beautiful search string on our behalf. All we had to do was answer those questions about Pico. Comparing to no rounding, that's very fair. So we can already see that we have some very interesting resources available. However, 
This is not where we want to stop our search because you can see that we have 42,000 results. And that is too many for any of us to go through. So here's some additional information that you need. On the left side, there are filters that you can use to refine your results. This works exactly the same way as if you were shopping on Amazon. I love to shop on Amazon, but I also want to make sure that the things that I buy on Amazon are not junk. So I typically will refine my search to only items with four star reviews, or I'll make sure that it's available for prime shipping, or I'll check all of those boxes. Think of this like checking your Amazon boxes. Some of the things that you always want to check are this. Limit to peer reviewed. Remember we said peer review is the gold standard. This is your scholarly material. The things that show up in uh, discovery are not necessarily peer reviewed. There are magazine articles, there are trade publications, and those things are very valuable, but they are not things that you want to cite in these particular assignments. So I'm gonna click that. We're starting at 42,000. And by clicking peer review, we reduce to 8,000. So that took out all of the magazines, all of the trade publications, anything that was not academic in nature. So we're already doing well. And that was just one filter. Now we also know that in the medical field, we need publications that are from the last five to 10 years. So this publication date filter can help you further reduce the number of resources that you're given. So I'm going to change this to 2017 update. And now we have 2000 results. So you see, we're just whittling away at our results until we're left with exactly what we need. If you scroll a little further down, there is a language filter. If you are a person who speaks only one language, you can filter by that language here. But then also geography. There are many international journals in EBSCO. So if you are interested only in a population from a specific country or continent, you can refine your search to just that, um, that area of the world here. So let's say you're only interested in articles that deal with the United States population. You can click that and you can see now we only have 113 articles. You can take your search from one and a half million results to under 100 results with these filters. So now we see we have a lot of things that might be useful. I'd like to point out if I can find it. Aha. If you see an article like this one, underneath the title and this information, you'll either see something that says linked full text or PDF full text or HTML full text or it might link out elsewhere. But if you see something that says request through interlibrary loan, that means that our library doesn't have access to the article. However, we can get it for you. The interlibrary loan process is pretty quick. Um, I think most articles are back between two and four days. So it is something that you would need to do a little bit ahead of time. This is not a 2 a.m. solution. <laughs> But if you're working on your paper ahead of time and you see the perfect article, but we're going to need to request it from elsewhere, you can just click that link, fill out your information, and the request will be sent to our staff. Any questions about that? At the graduate level, ILL interlibrary loan is often necessary um, because the results do get so specialized. So please don't be afraid to use that. Uh, graduate students typically do use that and the articles are delivered through email. Now, somebody asked earlier about saving articles. I have two suggestions for you. First, I'm going to sign in because that's necessary. I don't know about you guys, but being off campus, it asked me to sign in all the time, even when I'm signed in, I have to sign in again. <laughs> so there are a couple of different ways you can do this. When you're signed in, a share button appears right here. And if you click that, you can see where it says use permalink. 
this link here will take you back to this exact search. So it will apply all of the filters. It will apply exactly the search string that you used and you'll get the same results back. So that's one way is to take this link and paste it somewhere safe, maybe in a Word document or an email so that you can come back to it later. If you have a specific article that you really like, let's look at this one, for example. You can click on the title and you can either go to the full text and there should be a download button so that you can download it directly onto your local machine. So you can see the download button right here. Or if you'd like to save a link instead and not uh, mess up your hard drive, get it full, um, there is a permalink button over here on the right side. Now, why do you wanna use this link instead of the link that's up here in the address bar? This link will always, always bring you back to this page. This link is session based, and so it will only work for about eight hours. And then that link breaks. So when you're looking at these articles, find the permalink. And use that if you want to save the link to the article. Any questions about permalinking? You may have also heard that you can create an, a My EBSCO account. To do that, um, you can hit sign in up here. Uh, create an individual account. This is not your Maryville account. This is just an account with EBSCO. And after you do that and are signed in, then you can click the little folder button beside these articles and it will add it to a folder for you that you can access right here at the top. You may be thinking, that sounds really great. Sometimes people have trouble with this. My preference is the links, save the links somewhere else. Uh, but if you would like to use a My EBSCO account, I also support that. So there are a couple of different ways to save your search results to come back to later. So again, just to be sure that everyone saw, we click on advanced search. And then from here, Pico search. And then we can fill out the Pico search bar, hit submit, and it will pull results. Now, one suggestion that I have for you when you're making Pico, you know, you need one ingredient to put with another. Um, if you leave the comparison line blank the way that we just did, and then instead search for P, I, and O with a different I, so instead of rounding, you might say, eh, rounding is not a great example. Instead of exercise, you might say medication. <laughs> if that's something that you're trying to compare, um, instead of putting that in the comparison line, put it in the intervention line and leave the comp comparison line blank. That way you can synthesize those resources yourself. Do we feel confident about Pico Search? Will this recording be posted where we can view it later? Yes. And actually I'll probably go back and edit this video so that it goes a little bit quicker and I'll make sure there are chapters in the YouTube video as well so that you can skip right to the topic you want. Confident, excellent. Okay, in which case you remember that I told you that there are layers to the library's resources. We are in discovery right now. So we have all or most of the library's databases located in this place. But sometimes when you do a search and discovery, you get a lot of results that don't matter to you at all. Oh, I'm so glad that uh, this is useful to you. So if you are getting results in discovery that are consistently not what you need, for example, in the nursing theorist class, one of the theorists was Marion Good. And so my suggestion is always to search for the last name. Good. Guess what? <laughs> there were a lot of results that were not about Mary and Good at all. Good is a name that is used a lot. It's also just a word. 
So if you find yourself uh, frustrated by very unnecessary results, then you may need to go straight to the nursing databases and take it one layer in a little bit more specific. And we have multiple databases for you to choose from. So let me show you where to find those. Again, from the library's homepage, if we scroll down, here's the discovery search bar. But right above that, there's a resources tab. And this, this lists out several different other kinds of resources that we have available to you. But you're looking for databases. This lists all of the databases that we subscribe to at Maryville. If you want to look at just nursing databases, you'll go to the subject bar, scroll down until you find nursing, and then these are all of the nursing databases. But here's the trick. <laughs> Not all of these contain information that you're going to need for this course. Some of them contain different kinds of information. For example, I'll go ahead and give you a spoiler. At the very end of this list is an excellent, excellent resource called Up to Date. You may be used to using it at your practice. This is not the kind of resource that you need to use for this course. It doesn't contain academic journal articles at all. Instead, it's clinical practice information, which is extremely useful and I'm glad we have this but it's not for Nursing 601. So I have a challenge for you and we're gonna go back to our Mentimeter. So pull out your phone or device that you used to tell me about your information habits. We're gonna move on to the next question. On your own, please navigate to the databases A to Z list. You'll go to maryville.edu slash library hover over resources, then click databases. And I want you to look at the nursing databases list. And then when you think you know which ones are best for the evidence-based practice course, I want you to type the name of it here in the Mentimeter. If you haven't joined us on Menti before, uh, go to menti.com on your phone and use the code at the top of the screen and join us. And then take a look at the A to Z list for a couple of minutes. I'll let the results come in. If you have any questions, put them in the chat, but I'm gonna give you, let's say five minutes. All right, so, ooh, smart articles, interesting. So, okay, let's start at the top. You guys did a pretty good job on this. So the things that we're looking for are scholarly articles. So they're published in academic journals, and we're also looking for primary research. So I'm really, really pleased that nobody said Cochrane database of systematic reviews. Why? Because those are secondary. It says systematic reviews in the, the database title. So good job. You weren't tripped up by that. I noticed that someone said CINAHL. Yes. <laughs> someone said Medline. Also, yes. Someone in the chat said Ovid. Also, yes. Here are all of the databases that I suggest for you. Specifically, CINAHL and Medline. They are excellent. They are full of thousands of nursing journals and they operate exactly the same way that EBSCO Discovery does. They are both EBSCO databases. So I noticed that a couple of people said EBSCO. So the, the short version is that EBSCO is the umbrella company and it contains a lot of databases in it, including Discovery, uh, which is a search engine and not a database. But CINAHL is an EBSCO product and Medline is an EBSCO product. And so when you visit those databases, you'll see that the, um, the filters work exactly the same way. The search bar works exactly the same way. And frankly, they all look exactly alike. So sometimes people get a little bit confused uh, when they go from CINAHL to Medline and they think that they're looking at the same thing. But if you click those individual links, if you click the CINAHL link, you will be taken to one set of journals. And if you click on the Medline link, you will be taken to another set of journals. Even if the interface looks exactly the same, they are different products. 
And so one of my pieces of advice for you is if you find yourself not wanting to use discovery for whatever reason, maybe it's giving you a lot of crummy results that are not useful to you, and you decide to start in with CINAHL and you still don't find what you need, move on to the next one. <laughs> There are several databases here that are useful to you. They contain different journals. And so just because you didn't find anything in one doesn't mean that you won't find something in another. Medline, same thing. Really, really solid journal selection there. Ovid also has really excellent nursing journal collections. It's probably the largest. Don't quote me on that. It's really good. Um, it does have a slightly different interface, but all of the filters are still there. You'll still see the peer-reviewed filter. You'll still see the date range filter. Other databases may be nursing specific, so they may appear in that A to Z list, but they are not what you need. The systematic review database is a good example. I'm sorry to say it, but Smart Images is also an example. There are no academic journals in that one. Up to date, really excellent resource, but not for this course. Any question about um, the nursing databases, where to find them, or which ones you need for this class? Later in your nursing course career, you will use up to date a lot. <laughs> and I welcome that day, but this is not that day. Okay, so we're gonna start our search and discovery. We're gonna use the PICO search bar, but if we still don't find what we need, we move in a layer to these. Now you may be thinking, this was a lot <laughs> and I can't possibly remember it all. Well, I have good, good news for you as well. Uh, librarians are known for building research guides. They are little websites dedicated to big ideas. Um, so maybe course specific or maybe idea specific. And we do have a research guide built specifically for evidence-based practice. Let me show you how to find that because this will come in handy for you later as you're looking for things. Library website, your hub of operations, hover over resources, and then click subject guides. This is our repository of all of the little websites that the librarians at Maryville have built. If you scroll down to nursing, you'll see that we have nine guides. These could help you later on in the program as well. So don't forget that this is here. We're gonna look at the evidence-based practice guide. This has information about PICO. What is it? How do I make a question? Those resources are really excellent. There's also a section for finding research articles, where to find them, so links to those databases, saving your search history, so if you want to create a My EBSCO account, here are instructions for that, as well as a discussion of primary versus secondary sources. How can you tell the difference? How do you make sure you get the ones that you need? There is an explanation of the interlibrary loan process, so we talked about that a little bit earlier, as well as citation help. So I know that one thing that people struggle with when they come back to school is that they have to cite all of these sources in APA format, and that is a lot of information. <laughs> if you find yourself struggling with that, check out our guide for it. It could be very useful. There are also videos and tutorials and information about preparing a literature review, aka synthesizing your literature. So this guide is here for you, and I want you to please use it. So I want to take a couple of minutes to take questions, but remind you also that if you need assistance, there are several ways to get it as you're doing your research. If you want to talk to me or one of the other two research and instruction librarians at Maryville, you can email reference at maryville.edu and it will come to all three of us. You will get a faster answer if you email all three of us at this address. There's also the 24-7 chat that someone asked about earlier. Yes, it is manned by real librarians 24 hours a day. So if you are working on your research at 2 a.m. or you have a problem, uh, you can use that chat feature on our website and talk to a real librarian in the middle of the night. <laughs> 
You can also use the Ask a Librarian feature. We can have a Zoom call just like this one where we look for resources together and a librarian will help you and give you search strategies. If you need help, it is available to you, regardless of where you are, what time zone, uh, even what time of day. Normally we do work normal business hours, the actual Maryville librarians, but we have been known to make appointments with students outside of regular business hours to make sure that you get the help that you need. So don't be shy. 